Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Forbes, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to explain the Judicial Conference's longstanding opposition to mandatory minimum sentencing schemes. The Judicial Conference opposes mandatory minimum sentences because they block judges from considering the individual circumstances of particular cases. Mandatory minimum sentencing schemes create a one-size-fits-all system that requires federal judges to ignore individual differences in particular cases. Testimony in today's hearing illustrates the wide range of cases that come before federal judges. You will hear testimony from Ms. Serena Nunn, a first-time offender who was a minor participant in a drug distribution scheme organized by her boyfriend. You will hear a representative from the Border Patrol Union talking about Ignacio Ramos and Jose Campion, convicted of discharging a firearm while arresting a drug smuggler on the Texas border. And I will talk about Mr. Weldon Angelos, a record producer from Utah, who carried a firearm to several marijuana deals. Obviously, these are different cases that require different approaches. They require something other than a cookie-cutter approach to justice. But mandatory minimum sentences force judges to treat cases such as these as essentially indistinguishable. When federal judges are forced to follow mandatory minimum sentencing schemes, truly bizarre sentences result, which can seriously undermine public confidence in the system. In my written testimony, I talk at length about the 55-year prison sentence I was required to hand down to Mr. Weldon Angelos. His crimes were possessing a firearm during several drug deals, and he certainly deserved to be punished for that. But it made no sense for me to give a sentence to him that was far longer than he would have received for such heinous crimes as aircraft hijacking, terrorist bombing, second-degree murder, espionage, kidnapping, aggravated assault, sexual assault on a child, and rape. These are not just hypothetical illustrations. The same day that I sentenced Mr. Angelos to 55 years in prison, I also had before me Mr. Cruz Vizinay. He was convicted of murder for beating Clara Jenkins, a 68-year-old woman, repeatedly over the head with a log. I gave Mr. Vizinay the maximum sentence recommended by the guidelines, 22 years in prison. It was hard for me then and remains hard for me to this day to explain to Ms. Jenkins' family and to members of the public why that murderer received a far shorter sentence than a drug dealer who simply carried a firearm to several drug deals. Unfortunately, the implicit message to crime victims with such bizarre sentences is that their suffering does not count for as much as the abstract war on drugs. The public, too, will wonder about whether their hard-earned tax dollars are well spent to imprison Mr. Angelos for essentially the rest of his life. The cost will be in the neighborhood of $1.3 million, and probably much more as the taxpayers will be required to subsidize his geriatric medical treatment in prison. Every empirical study with which I am familiar strongly suggests that the taxpayers would get far more bang for their buck by not imprisoning Mr. Angelos while he is a senior citizen and using the money saved to put additional law enforcement officers on the street or extra prosecutors into the Department of Justice. Because of problems like these, the public favors allowing judges to make the final decision about what sentence should ultimately be imposed. A recent poll shows that three-quarters of all Americans support allowing judges to set aside mandatory sentences if another sentence would be, in their judgment, more appropriate. On behalf of the Judicial Conference, I urge the subcommittee to start the legislative process to eliminate inflexible mandatory minimum sentencing schemes. A good place to start would be by unstacking the 924C mandatory minimum that produced the irrational 55-year sentence for Mr. Angelos that I've just discussed, as well as the 159-year sentence for Marion Hungerford, plus we shouldn't forget uh, three years of supervised release after that, that I review in my uh, testimony. A more general solution would be, allowed to, would be to allow judges to go below mandatory minimum sentences whenever the sentencing guidelines advise a lower sentence. The guidelines represent the considered judgments of a congressionally created agency, the Sentencing Commission, about what sentence is usually appropriate and could serve as a signal that a lower sentence is necessary in a particular case. No doubt there are other solutions that are possible as well, 
but in closing, I urge the subcommittee to, ma to pass something that will allow federal judges to impose fair and appropriate sentences in each individual case. Unfortunately, mandatory minimum sentences require federal judges to ignore obvious differences in the cases that come before them, to impose absurdly long sentences that lack any connection to a logical system of punishment, and to waste taxpayer dollars by incarcerating offenders for decades when the money could be better spent to fight crime elsewhere. I urge the subcommittee to start the process which will end mandatory minimum injustices. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.